Gress. Well, good evening. And uh, I know it's not Sabbath yet, but happy Sabbath. And um, we're going to be looking at a number of things here that um, are going to be quite interesting, hopefully. Um, so we're addressing in this study, so we're going to be addressing 2030, but we're going to begin with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath that's coming, the fellowship that we can have, for the promise of your Holy Spirit, and for the things that you teach us. I pray that you can guide and direct us as we study together. Help us to understand the things we read. And um, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can rest upon all who view this video. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, what you see in front of you is uh, is not a good source of scientific information, if anybody's ever looked into it. And I'm going to be addressing, because I had somebody sending me a bunch of emails, um, uh, so I had to watch a bunch of things and read a bunch of things. And this is... I understand why people can read this stuff and get the impressions that they do, but the people writing these articles are not honest. Uh, one is if either they're they're not honest or they have no understanding of science whatsoever, and they're just um, you know posers. But I would believe that they they must know that the scientific papers they're reading don't actually give the information. Uh, that they're claiming. So they give you references and they quote from papers, but they don't seem to understand anything that they're reading in these papers. Now, I just want to, do, before I look at this, I want to switch this. I'm going to go to Bible verse here. Not two Bible verses, actually, which we've looked at before. And this one is in Revelation chapter 18, verse 23. <clears throat> Get rid of all the Greek numbers there. <clears throat> now, I'm going to go back to um, verse 21. So it says, And a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman or whatsoever craft he be, of whatsoever craft he be, shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. Now, when we're addressing Babylon, what is Babylon? The definition of Babylon? Well, what is it prophetically? What is it symbolizing? Confusion. Rome. Okay, so it's it's so it, it's Rome, papal Rome here in this context. Uh, the kingdoms of this world at the end of the world, and it's symbolic, right? That is, we're not taking this literally in any sense. Correct. Exactly. And we know then that um, Babylon here is represented in this in language that we find in the Old Testament. We see this story, this destruction of, of the city. Um, we see this in uh, Ezekiel. We see it in other places. I think Ezekiel 27, uh, if I remember that's the one where it's going to talk about the lament for Tyre, and you're going to see that's basically describing pretty much what you see in Revelation chapter 18. And so we know that Tyre represents uh, the papacy in that context. And now when we go to the verse 23, we run into something that people interpret a certain way, and I think that when we look at Revelation 17 and 18, and we look at 
of the passage that we're going to look at in there's actually that relate to this revelation 8 23 18 23 says and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee so who's the bridegroom and who's the bride so this would be christ in his church we're not we're not taking it literally to refer to you know marriages that there isn't going to be any marriages or anything yeah uh yeah so ezekiel 26 and 27 are both against tyrus um and then it says for thy merchants were the great men of the earth for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived now, when we address something like sorceries, um, that word we know is pharmakia in the Greek, and it has to do with poisons, right? So we've made this connection, people have made this connection, but this is referring to drug medications and specifically to, so they use this verse to say, this is talking about that is by the where all nations deceived. Now, if we go to Leviticus 18, verse 23, we're going to have a, a verse that's connected basically by the, the, the number. It's Revelation 18, 23 and Leviticus 18, 23. And here it says, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion which we would say is Babylon, correct? Yes. Yeah, so if we go to Revelation 18, um, we can see that this is the fall of Babylon, but it's continuing from Revelation 17. And what you see here is this woman who's riding a beast. That is, she's having relationship with the beast, correct? This is Leviticus 18.23, which it's talking about there literally, but we can see that it is applies symbolically. And so it, when we look at the sorceries, what are the sorceries referring to specifically in the context of Leviticus 18.23 then and Revelation 18.23? Because we're not taking it literally. We're taking it symbolically. So what would the sorceries be? that deceive the whole world. A woman riding a beast is what is it symbolizing? The union of church and state with the church dominating the state. Right, so this is a union of church and state. That is the sorceries that are being referred to. And now some people can argue, they can say, well, we had a type of the Sunday law, which was the pandemic and tied to that was. And so we can look at that as a symbol of something that is to come. What we couldn't do is say that the pandemic is the Sunday law and that are the mark of the beast, right? We couldn't, we couldn't make that application. And why can't we? What, what rule would we be breaking? Which one in Miller's rules? Well, well, we could apply to Miller's rules. So, yeah. So if you're going to look at Miller's rules, which one of Miller's rules would that be a transgression of? I mean, it might be a few. Would it be rule number eight? That comes to mind, yes. Figures always have a figurative meaning and are used much in prophecy to represent future things, times and events, such as mountains, meaning governments, beasts, meaning kingdoms, waters, meaning people, land, meaning word of God, day, meaning year, right? Mm -hmm. So now we know also rule six, 
Uh, God revealed things to come by visions in figures and parables. And in this way, the same things are often time revealed again and again by different visions or in different figures and parables. If you wish to understand them, you must combine them all in one. So when we use Miller's rules, we're going to compare these scriptures with scriptures and we're going to understand them figuratively. That is, we can't take it literally. We can't look at the word pharmakia and say, well, that's talking about drug medications. And so the world is deceived by drug medications. And if it had been the case, Ellen White would have written about that instead of about the Sunday law and church and state combined. So, so we know that in order to follow Miller's rules, we have to, uh, we have to apply this figuratively. We can't look at it literally. Now, um, there was also, I'm trying to remember if there was another 18. Um, trying to remember. There was another 1823. I know there is for one other one. Um, I don't think there is for this one. I just have the two 1823s. Um, okay. So, so in, in, in doing this study here, we know that there are many people, non-Adventists, who are uh, often involved in, if you look at their belief systems, uh, they would be the furthest thing from Christianity. Uh, they would be New Age spiritualism. Um, they they speak out against some things, which we would agree with them in that point. And um, they would also speak out against the government trying to tell us what to do. Um, that is, we believe in the freedom to do what we want with our bodies as far as health is concerned. So I'm going to go to, back to this article. Now is an example of this. Now, I grew up um, in a home where we were into a natural health. We went to health food stores. We bought things. We ate things like brewer's yeast, blackstrap molasses, and whatever the fad was of the day, uh, we knew about it. Uh, my brother Dave was heavily into uh, herbal teas and things like that. And um, he was, you know, basically my best friend uh, growing up. Um, besides, you know, my friends, definitely the best, my best friend in the family. And, um, you know, I sort of followed in his footsteps. I was interested in natural health. I read a lot of the books that he had. And we would discuss uh, the health ideas of the day back in the 1970s and, and in through into the 1980s as well. So, so I was very familiar with ideas. I But I wouldn't take the position that is the mark of the beast. Because that would be taking prophecy in a different way than it's intended. Just like if I was to say, you know, the UP symbol, U UPC symbol is a mark of the beast. That would be not understanding the symbolic nature of the book of Revelation. We know that the mark of the beast is the mark of the authority. It's Sunday of the Catholic Church's authority. Now, so I've grown up reading lots of these things, and I've read lots of these articles in people on Facebook will constantly, uh, over the years, you know, link you to different things, claiming that some food is dangerous or some food is good for you, some miracle cure of something that you should do. Most of the time, this is not just mis misinformation, it's often harmful information. That is, it's information that if you followed it, uh, you, you could be doing yourself harm. Now, what they do here is they, 
they say it's real. Science paper documents self-assembled magnetic nanosystems for cybernetic biocircuitry interface and control system in humans, including DNA hydrogel technology. So I went through and read a great deal on this. This is one of the things I have to do this week. A um, little bit frustrating. One is this is complete misinformation. Now, does anybody know what a self-assembled magnetic nanosystem is? Anybody can explain what that is? I have no idea. Okay, right. And, and I would say almost none of us understand any of this that's being talked about. Now, I've followed um, nanotechnology for a while. One is um, uh, there's a Christian, James Tours, who um, is basically one of the leading uh, scientists in nanotechnology research. And um, he's a Jew who became a Christian. He's a, a very intelligent man. But more than that, he's a very solid Christian, studies his Bible for an hour and a half or two hours every morning, goes for a run every morning, takes care of his health. And he uh, does presentations regarding the origins of life, that you could not have life come about by itself. And he explains the science on what's involved in this nanotechnology, how much work it's involved just to construct uh, a nano uh, machine, a nano, you know, whatever they call it, um, nano, nano machines, I guess is the word. Um, now, when they say self-assembled magnetic nanosystems, what, what these are is these are chemical reactions that have to be controlled in a laboratory. None of this could happen inside a human being. Um, now, they say cybernetic biocircuitry interface and control systems in humans. I mean, this is just a bunch of scary words, uh, but have no basis in any of the papers uh, that I've read that they refer us to. And now there's this thing called DNA hydrogel, but I mean, this is something that you would use in a laboratory. And, and people just see the word DNA and they think, oh, they're fooling around with human DNA or something like that. Well, it's nothing to do with human DNA. It has to do with how they uh, construct things. So these are, are used for, um, different types of experiments and so forth and and what they've talked talk about here is they, they give some pictures and they use lots of big words so it says the average person living today has no idea how far the development of self-assembly nanotech and bio circuits has progressed now and it says so-called fact checker checkers professional propagandists and liars deliberately mis people mislead people into thinking there's no such thing as self-assembling graphene-based biocircuitry systems that could be feasibly injected into people and called a vaccine but the published scientific literature lays out a comprehensive well-documented body of research that shows this technology is quite real and has been tested in biological systems for at least two decades and of course that paragraph is completely false but on every level um, it's just, it, it, it's making an assertion and it's going to use references to, um, this idea that you don't need a microchip to be injected, that you could have this circuit circuitry be assembled in vivo, that is in the life after injection. And it's just not supported by any of the science, scientific literature that they, they give us as references. And I'm not going to go through all the scientific literature. One is most of us could not understand what it's even talking about. And, and maybe it's possible they have no idea what it's talking about. They just pick up on some of these words. But what they're taking is all of these things that are even completely unrelated. And they're putting them together and just picking up on these different words. Now, it, it, it's quite remarkable, actually. So. I don't think, this is my, my view, I, I think that people, if you're going to believe this, you would have to have a good reason to believe it. You wouldn't take the assertion of something like, and say, well, it sounds like 
they must know what they're talking about. So we're just going to accept that this is what they're talking about. But they're picking and choosing things completely out of context. That is, a lot of these things aren't even related to each other. That is, they're not part of the same technology, but they make it as if it's all just one sort of technology. Um, now, when we talk about self-assembly, I mean, that's kind of a little bit misleading. These are just chemical reactions that occur in a laboratory under controlled situations. Um, sometimes these are used to make different types of polymers. Uh, one thing you cannot do is you cannot make micro uh, nano circuitry that is going to um, be assembled in somebody that's going to run a program uh, that's going to somehow change their DNA or control them. So, so everything they said there is basically false. But and, and then they talk about these DNA hydrogels. Well, these aren't related to any of this other thing at all. So, so there's just no relationship between these hydrogels and nanotechnology. Um, so they say, after they give us all this information or misinformation, what this research demonstrates is that self-assembling nanotechnology is real, which it's not. Biocircuitry interface nanotech is real, which it's not. The nanowires and nano circuits can be controlled by external electro electromagnetic fields. And, and of course, that's nothing to do with any kind of program. This has to do with using magnetic fields uh, in, as part of a catalyst in a chemical reaction. And the tech has been studied and developed for at least two decades and is backed by a large body of published research, which of course it's not. It is therefore feasible for today's vaccines to contain self-assembly nanotechnology that interferes with human biology and is controlled by external broadcasts. This doesn't prove that such a scenario is happening for certain, but it shows that the tech exists and is feasible, which of course they haven't shown. Um, so they're going to give you some uh, a link to an article from December of 2012, and you're not going to understand what it's talking about. But definitely, this is not talking about any of the things that they just told you about. Um, they're talking about using um, uh, like the distribution of medicines through uh, what they call biotherapeutics and that you would use uh, like magnetic resonance imaging or magnetics to trigger the release of certain chemicals uh, or drugs. But this has nothing to do with anything about nanotechnology. So. So they're just misleading. There's a bunch of bluster and a bunch of misdirection, sleight of hand. But the purpose of this, what's the purpose of what is their their goal? So I've been wondering, <clears throat> wondering why. What is their well their goal is to sell advertising. And that's, well, that's no, true. always that's always been medicine, whatever you want to call it, uh, ever since I can remember, is it's the selling of, because of fear, to sell products to people that don't work so that they can make money. And, and so we need to look at these things with a lot more skepticism. Um, they're definitely not interested in your health. Um, So it's just everything here is, is meant to be shocking, to give you fear, so that you will spend ridiculous amounts of money on all kinds of different things that are supposed to protect you from the supposed dangers of the food supply or the water supply or the air or whatever it is. And, and I don't think this has any place, and this is my view, right? But I've spent a lot of years looking at this stuff. And there is natural health stuff that's valid, but most of it is just to sell products. And, and some people may dis disagree with me on this point, but that's, that's my understanding. Now, so I bring that up um, just because it's something that I looked at and spent a lot of time on this week. 
but it relates to the idea of 2030. So one of the main things that the person who sent me emails was trying to tell me is that, um, and, and some of you may have watched, I can't think of the doctor's name, the guy's name, but he talks about how human beings are hackable. Now, this person lives pretty much in a fantasy world. Uh, their beliefs, their ideas, as we talked about last week, um, the World Economic Forum is really just a scam. It's uh, Klaus Schwab's way of making a lot of money. And um, it's extremely juvenile views on how economics works. If they were, I mean, they've been talking about these plans for a long time. And we could say, well, they now have their opportunity for the first time uh, to um, implement them with the mandates. But these things aren't going to work. It's not going to bring about the things that they're planning to do. Human beings are not hackable. And even when he talks about that, he's talking mostly about the technology that we use to connect to information that we can be manipulated. And that, that's probably true to a large degree. People definitely can be manipulated by information. But as Christians, we have nothing to fear about being hacked against our will. Because what, what would happen if God was to allow Satan to be able to just hack human beings against their will? You know, good Seventh-day Adventists who are studying their Bible. Is it that we, that in order not to be hacked, we have to, um, what, what, would it, what is it we would have to do? Why would God not allow Satan the ability to just hack human beings? Anybody got any ideas on this? Well, wouldn't that be a compromisation of free will? Right. So if, if God allowed Satan to take away our free will, then the whole great controversy would be meaningless. God has given us free will. And it's the choices that we make that determine our character. And those are moral choices. It's the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's sin. Sin is what? leads us away from God and changes our character. Con continuing to repeat sin will destroy the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. But many people, many Christians, many non-Christians even, are frightened. They're frightened about what governments are going to do. If they're Christians, they'll be frightened about what Satan is going to do. And we have nothing to fear. If we are studying God's word and we're being obedient in the things that we know to be true, we don't have to worry about Satan sneaking up on us and somehow unwittingly, um, you know, against our will, he just somehow hacks us and we now become uh, cyborgs, you know, uh, of some sort. So, so the whole idea, from my perspective, from everything that I've seen and studied, is just not feasible. They don't have the technology. They're talking about what they might have in 2030. They definitely don't have it now. And somebody doesn't lose their salvation because they received it. They're not going to all of a sudden be hackable. Now. Different people, of course, have different convictions on what they should do. And people can receive uh, believing that they're doing something moral. They may not be in informed. Would, would God then allow that person to be lost if they're living up to the light that they have? It just doesn't seem reasonable. Okay. Now, I, I want to switch gears a little bit, and, um, and we're going to look at some of this stuff, um, you know, human beings being hackable and what the plans are for 2030 by the World Economic Forum. 
but I've been so caught up in studying all of this chronology that's unfolded over uh, the past week, especially regarding Odilia's study. So Odilia did a very good study on Sabbath. Um, I would agree with almost all of it. And, and it's a study that I had done previously. So I'd looked at some of these numbers and these dates. And um, the basic idea here is that we have these signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. So November 1st, 1755, what happened on that date? Great earthquake. Yeah, so the Lisbon earthquake. May 19th, 1780. Dark day. Yep, the dark day. And Isn't November. It? Yep, is the dark day. And then November 13th, 1833. Stars falling. Yeah. Now Ellen White talks about these these things. Uh the Lisbon earthquake. Um and we know that these things occurred. Um the Lisbon earthquake, how does she put it? Where does she place it time-wise, chronologically? Near the time of the end, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So so she's going to put this at the time of the end, and, and I'm going to... Uh, just read her statements here, so we'll put them up. Um, okay, so there's a lot of in, it's, it, this is the chapter in the Great Controversy, Heralds of the Morning. So, these heralds, heralds of the morning are these, these messages um, that we get from the signs, the signs of the times. And I don't want to, well, I'm going to just read a bit here. One of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths revealed in the Bible is that Christ's second coming is that of Christ's second coming to complete the great work of redemption. To God's pilgrim people, so long left to sojourn in the region and shadow of death, a precious, joy-inspiring hope is given in the promise of his appearing, who is the resurrection and the life, to bring home again his banished. And so this is obviously the promise of the second coming, that's, that we have these heralds of the morning. Uh, she says in the next paragraph, the coming of Christ to usher in the reign of righteousness has inspired the most sublime and impassioned utterances of the sacred writers. So there's, she's going to quote some passages from these different writers, um, the Psalms, from the prophet Isaiah, from Habakkuk, and, um, and also his promises to his disciples. Now, where I want to get to here um, is... Uh, this next part. So I don't want to read all this. Okay. Okay, here is where I want to read. Prophecy not only foretells the manner and object of Christ's coming, but presents tokens by which men are to know when it is near. Said Jesus, there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. The revelator thus describes the first of the signs to precede the second advent. There was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became blood. Now, what does she mean by tokens? What is a token? An example. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's quite how I would put it. 
Um, well, if you if you go back just a little bit to what you were talking about, yeah, the title of this chapter is what? Heralds of the Morning. Right. Now, what is a herald? Well, a herald is somebody who goes before a king and proclaims his coming or any important person. Okay, so if we if this is outlining the heralds plural yeah. of the morning. Mm -hmm. That's giving us that the Lisbon earthquake, the dark day, and the falling of the stars. We're showing that morning was soon to break. Right. So now, but what morning is she? Is she giving a tacit reference upon? Well, that would be the second coming. Would it be the second coming, or would it be a the judgment. day of atonement? Yeah. So the day of atonement, which Ellen White. So one of the things when we studied the. Um, the foundation of this message, so examining the foundation study. One of the things that we came to understand is that October 22nd, 1844 is in a, a sense, and in a very real sense, the beginning of the second coming. That is, the language attached to the beginning of the judgment is the language of the second coming. And, and Christ could have come ere this, right? He could have come before now. Right. So, um, so these were the signs of the second coming, as she talks about. But ultimately, it is the second coming is not a single day. It's symbolized by the Day of Atonement. That is, the Day of Atonement contains everything connected with the second coming. Right? That's what it's illustrating. But it's illustrating it from October 22nd, 1844, up until Christ returns. Now, a, a token in, um, this is Webster's Dictionary, is a sign. Now, something intended to represent or indicate another thing or event. So it can be a sign, right? Thus, the rainbow is a token of God's covenant established with Noah. The blood of the Paschal Lamb sprinkled on the doors of the Hebrews was a token to the destroying angel of God's will that he should pass by those houses. Um, so that would be the primary way which, which we would understand token. It has other means, coins, um, can be tokens, etc. So it can also be uh, illnesses. So, so when we're looking at this token, then, that's being discussed, it's this herald of the morning. So Christ presents these tokens, as, as, and, the, and they're, they're going to be these images that are going to be talking about, uh, that leading us to the second coming. And when we studied in Revelation, uh, we saw that, that the symbols there that I had usually placed as the future have already happened. That is October 22nd, 1844, represents the second coming. So if we go there, uh, we'll just go to this verse here. Revelation 6, we've looked at it before, but um, in other studies, but this was one of the things regarding the seven seals. And what I had written in my Bible um, is you read Revelation 6, uh, verse 12, the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And what I have written in my old Bible is, you are here, between verse 13 and verse 14. But we know that this language, even though it's the language of the second coming, is already been fulfilled. 
That is, this is the sixth seal. Where is the seventh seal? The seventh seal. Where is the seventh seal? And where is it opened up in, in the book of Revelation? So this is the sixth seal, right? This is the seven seals, and it's going to go through these seals. And where do we see the seventh seal opened? What is it? When and what? So you're going to have this question, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And then you're going to have Revelation chapter 7. And it's yeah, going to Revelation talk, 8. Well, right. And then you're going to have Revelation chapter 8. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And we understand that this has already occurred. That this silence in heaven about the space of half an hour occurred at the opening of the seventh seal on October 22nd, 1844. So we don't look at this as something in the future. This is something that has already occurred. We see the same thing with the trumpets. We see that they lead us to October 22nd, 1844. They don't lead us beyond it. That is October 22nd, 1844 is the beginning of the second coming. It's the day of the Lord. Right, in that context. Any thoughts on that? Okay, well, we can discuss it when we look at the spirit of prophecy here. <clears throat> so she says, these signs were witnessed before the opening of the 19th century. In fulfillment of this prophecy, there occurred in the year 1755. Um, and I ended up, yeah, the year 1755, the most terrible earthquake that has ever been recorded. Though commonly known as the Great Earthquake, um, though commonly known as the Earthquake of Lisbon, pardon me, it extended to the greater part of Europe, Africa, and America. It was felt in Greenland, in the West Indies, in the island of Madeira, in Norway and Sweden. Great Britain and Ireland. It pervaded in an extent of not less than 4 million square miles. In Africa, the shock was almost as severe as in Europe. A great part of Algiers was destroyed, and a short distance from Morocco, a village containing 8 or 10,000 inhabitants was swallowed up. A vast wave swept over the coast of Spain and Africa, engulfing cities and causing great destruction. It was in Spain and Portugal that the shock manifested its extreme violence. At Cadiz, the inflowing wave was said to be 60 feet high. Mountains, some of the largest in Portugal, were impetuously shaken, as it were, from their very foundations, and some of them opened at their summits, which were split and rent in a wonderful manner, huge masses of them being thrown down into the adjacent valleys. Flames are related to have issued from these mountains. At Lisbon, a sound of thunder was heard underground, etc. So it's going to go through and talk about this earthquake. Um, now, what's the significance then of this earthquake? Why do we take this earthquake and apply it in the, and I'm sorry, I didn't hit share, so you didn't see what I was reading. Um, why do we apply it in the way that we do? Why do we say that this is the earthquake talked about in the book of Revelation? What is Ellen White trying to tell us here? That this is the first of the signs that should be accepted as showing the, the, end, the time of the end. And, and we would find that most Adventists wouldn't apply these verses in this way, unless they accept the spirit of prophecy. That is, they would say, well, this can't be talking about the earthquake in 1755. That was so long ago. 
this great earthquake, the sixth seal must be in the future. Now, what this movement does not do is we do not take the prophecies that have been fulfilled in the past and re reapply them as their primary fulfillment in the future, correct? Right. Now, somebody watching our videos might think we do that if they're just looking at what we're doing superficially. That is, what we're going to do is we're going to see that this Lisbon earthquake has a counterpart for this movement. And we'll see how this works, how these, um, these things in the past, how history is repeated. But it's repeated in something that is not a fulfillment of the prophecy in a direct sense. That is, we're not going to be looking for these seals to be unsealed in our history and then looking for an earthquake that fits the bill for the sixth seal. Right? That's, that's not what we're doing. But we are connecting the history of the past with the present. And, and this is what Odilio was doing. And, and what he was doing was correct. That is, he was doing it in the correct fashion. He was using the system of study that this met movement has been using, that Jeff had been using. So we'll see that this, this is a, a valid understanding of things. Now, as we go on here, she'll see that the next one, she says 25 years later appeared the next sign mentioned in the prophecy. Now, is this 25 years later significant? Yes. Okay. Why? Why the number 25? Five by five for the, uh, the wise virgins. Okay. Now, do, now, we know that how many days are between midnight and the midnight cry? Isn't it 25? 25 as well. So you can see the five by five, the five wise virgins, and and also the, the connection between midnight and the midnight cry. So it, it's not just arbitrary. She's not just telling us it was 25 years and, you know, it's just like some kind of chronological detail that's unimportant. She mentions it, mentions it because it has an importance. She's drawing our attention to its importance. She's not days between the midnight and the midnight cry because that knowledge wasn't even really understood in her day that is adventist really didn't understand uh when the midnight cry occurred but she's going to say 25 years later appeared the next sign the darkening of the sun and the moon what rendered this more striking was the fact that the time of its fulfillment had been definitely pointed out In the Savior's conversation with his disciples upon Olivet, after describing the long period of trial for the church, the 1260 years of papal persecution, concerning which he had promised that the tribulation should be shortened, he thus mentioned certain events to precede his coming and fixed the time when the first of these should be witnessed. In those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, Mark 13:24. 1260 days or years terminated in 1798 a quarter of a century earlier persecution and almost wholly ceased following this persecution according to the words of christ the sun was to be darkened on the 19th of may 1780 this prophecy was fulfilled now this symbol of 1780 what is it what is 1780 July 18th. Okay. Numbers out of order, yeah. Yeah, so it is July 18th, but it's also, we know that there's 187 days from the, from the spring equinox to the autumnal equinox. So how many days are remaining from the, the, the autumnal equinox to the vernal equinox in the spring again? If there's 187 days for the first part, how many would remain for the second part?
178, because 178 and 187 is 365, correct? Yep. So, so one of the things that, that we often ignore is this connection between the spring equinox to the fall equinox as the same span of time from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. That is, that span of time was chosen uh, because of the connection it has to the span of time between the two e equinoxes. But that means also 178 is the remainder. So it still gives us the symbol of July 18th. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Okay. Now, this dark day also happened at a, another important time. If you go to the, the calendar converter and you pick up this date, which is May 19th, um, it's going to be, now, if you look at the, the biblical calendar and um, in, in the calendar converter, it's the one at the top, and it's going to say the 13th day of the second month. And that dark day is going to begin on the 13th, and it's going to be uh, continue through the night as well into the 14th of the second month. On the rabbinic calendar, it's the 14th day of the second month. Um, and where is this other program here? So I know you can't see what I'm doing, but I'm going here. And in 1780, the, the second month is going to begin on So, so the first day, I'm just counting this on my hands here, six. So if we're using a calendar where we're observing the month, instead of just counting, it's going to be the 14th day of the second month. Now, what's the 14th day of the second month? Passover for those that handled the dead bodies. Okay. On trip. Right. So the significance of then of this then is to this movement, what is the significance of this second Passover? So it was those that were either on a long journey and couldn't make it, or those that had been defiled by touching a dead body and did not have the time uh, to be cleansed in order to observe the Passover. So what's the significance of it to this movement? Where do we get the significance from? What what did Jeff what what chapter did in the Bible did Jeff use two chapters together to deal with this this second Passover? What's it connected to? So Second Chronicles, chapter 29, we're going to go there. Now this is Hezekiah's reign. Hezekiah is going to cleanse the temple. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, so Hezekiah is counting his reign here anyway. Um, now it could be that he counts his reign fall to fall. So it's going to be the first month. The first month is in the spring. But he's going to open the doors of the house of the Lord, and he's going to repair them. And they're going to take eight days to cleanse the most holy place and eight days to cleanse the holy place. And can they keep the Passover then? So it says in Second uh, Chronicles 29, 17, now they began on the first day of the first month. To sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. 
So, so they're going to have 16 days to do this cleansing. Then they went into Hezekiah the king and said, we have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof and the showbread table with all the vessels thereof. Right. So they're going to have this cleansing of the sanctuary. But in doing this, they can't keep the Passover. Um, and then it says, uh, Hezekiah commanded, where is it here? I got to find the part where they're going to see. So they do all these offerings as well. I guess it's going to be in the, sec the next chapter, chapter 30. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel in his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they're going to have this decree and they're going to invite the people from northern Israel. And this is what this movement is about. It's the cleansing of the sanctuary and the invitation to northern Israel and, and to all Judah, right? So, so the significance then of the dark day being on this second Passover, is that just some coincidence that we shouldn't pay attention to? Just, just happens. It's going to be on Sunday. Or should we pay attention to it? Shouldn't we be pay, paying attention to it? I think we should. Now, we have this date um, lined up in our history, and, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, but one of the things we see is uh, here, I'll. I'll I'll go to the calendar converter so you can see what I'm talking about. So we're going to go to this um, this 16th or 14th day of the second month, the second Passover. And we can see here, you see the calendar converter. Um, here's today. Here's where we are right now, June 17th. And... Uh, we're going to go to back to the second Passover just a few days ago. And that was this year. It was on May 16th. And if I go back another year on the 21st, it was on May 27th. In 2020, it was on May 8th. And in 2019, it was on May 20th. Now, we can kind of go back here, though. We can see that it went from the 13th to the 14th. So really, if you look at this calendar, and, and you can see here, it's exactly the same year as 1780. So if I, if I go to 1780 and I type it in, you'll see it's the same. See that? Same date here, same date here, same date here. So that means in 2019, we had something that paralleled us to this dark day. At least as a symbol. Now, so what is the dark day warning us of? that the time of the end was soon to befall the world. Yeah, and, and we're going to have, so there they're going to address the time of the, you're, you're putting it to the time of the end. But Ellen White says it's not predicting the time of the end. It's, it's in connection with the time of the end. But it's pointing forward to October 22nd, 1844. That the Lisbon earthquake, the dark day, and the falling of the stars are tokens about what's going to happen on October 22nd, 1844, the coming judgment. It's, it's occurring in connection with the time of the end. 
Now, in May 19th, 2019, did we have anything that would parallel in our movement uh, this coming judgment? Twenty nineteen, what were we looking at in this movement? We were just beginning to to really be try to understand what was going to happen on July eighteenth. Right. So we so we were looking at November 9th back in twenty nineteen in this movement. Because this movement in May uh nineteenth, twenty nineteen, was it talking about July eighteenth? I thought it was just beginning to. Well, I was teaching about July 18th, but I'd actually set it aside. Um, so it's not going to be till after September 7th that Jeff is going to reintroduce July 18th. It was introduced in 2018 at the end of October, the beginning of November, but it was rejected by Parminder and Tess. So nobody in the movement's talking about July 18th, or at least very few people are. Delio's interested in it. Stephen's interested in it. I'm interested. Few people I know are interested, but most people are not accepting it. Right. So, so we can see that we have this symbol here. Nothing happens on this day. I actually know a guy who was predicting that a dark day was going to happen uh, based upon this, but but it didn't happen. And this is going to be you know, 200 and what, 39 years after um, the dark day. So, you know, so nothing happened on that date, but as a symbol, it at least existed in our line. And I wrote about it at the time as well. Um, but it wasn't, uh, my, and I did send you guys the paper. Um, in the email. Okay, so so we have this dark day, and we can see that it's pointing forward to a coming judgment, and and the sign was there in our movement, not so much as a dark day itself, but I'm, I'm going to deal with this later, the chronology of this. Um, so it's going to talk about it. We all know about the dark day, so we don't need to go into uh, detail about about it. Um, and let's do the dark day. <laughs> so now you're going to look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. And he pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now, can we attach this symbol of the dark day to the budding trees of spring? As Ellen White does here. Okay, let, let's go back a paragraph. So she says, May 19th, 1780, stands in history as the dark day since the time of Moses, no period of darkness of equal density, extent, and duration has ever been recorded. The description of this event, as given by eyewitnesses, is but an echo of the words of the Lord, recorded by the prophet Joel, Joel 2,500 years previous to their fulfillment. So if they were fulfilled 2,500 years previous, When did he, what year did he write this? When did, when did he give the prophecy? What's 2,500 years before 1780?
about 620 BC. Okay. So six specifically, 1780 minus 2,500 gives us 720, but we know we subtracted, so we add a year. So it's going to be, as Iran put there, 721 BC. Now, what happens in 721 BC? Now we know uh, we know that um, isn't that Assyria taking Israel captive? Okay, so in 723 you have Hoshea being taken captive, right? Right. And then two years later, you're going to have the walls of Jerusalem or walls of Jerusalem, the walls of Samaria broken down by uh sargon the, the second and he's going to take israel captive in the spring there in 721 right so this is being written this prophecy in connection with the fact that that hoshea had been taken captive which starts the 2520 so you can see that this She's mentioning 20 years, technically, you know, sort of, and 2,500 years. So in a sense, she's illustrating the 2520, but in an indirect way. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, so the 2520 is there. She's talking about the end of the 1260, but we know that the end of that 1260 is... Uh, the set last end of the indignation, because the first end of the indignation is the 1260 for paganism. So the 1260 for, for the papacy is the last end of the indignation. So, so then we, we, we can look at this and we can see its connection to the 2520. But now the question that we would have to ask is can we connect this to some event in our history. So I talked about the symbol of May 19th, 2019, but we have another date that we would, that we, that we would say that the budding trees of spring are connected with. Okay, 9-11. Does Jeff connect 9-11 to the budding trees of spring? I believe so. Yes. So, so we know that that is connected to the budding trees of spring because of the sprinkling of the rain, right? Connected with 9-11. Okay. So, so we have that. So we have um, an earthquake here that we're going to have to connect to our history. We can see that we've we've used the symbolic date of May 19th, 2019, um, but we're going to connect it also to 9-11. And then we have a third um, sign. And this sign is going to be the falling of the stars. She says, when the Savior pointed out to his followers the signs of his return, he foretold the state of backsliding that would exist just prior to his second advent. There would be, as in the days of Noah, the activity and stir of worldly business and pleasure seeking, buying, selling, planting, building, marrying, and giving in marriage, with forgetfulness of God and the future life. For those living at this time, Christ's admonition is, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeity and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The condition of the church at this time is pointed out in the Savior's words in the Revelation. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead 
And to those who refuse to arouse from their careless security, the solemn warning is addressed. If therefore thou shalt not watch, it will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt know not what hour it will come upon thee. So which church is that? Revelation 3, 1 to 3, that marks the time of the end. It's not Laodicea. Sardis. Sardis, right? So Sardis is the church at the time of the end. And then you're going to have Philadelphia, which is the church uh, dealing with um, uh, probably the period from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. At least it includes that. And then you would have Laodicea follow afterwards. So, so we can see here in Rev, it's the church of Sardis that receives this warning to watch. It was needful that men should be awakened to their danger, that they should be roused to prepare for the solemn events connected with the close of probation. The prophet of God declares the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Who shall stand when he appeareth? Who is of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity? To them that cry, my God, we know thee, yet have transgressed his covenant and hastened after another God, hiding iniquity in their hearts and loving the paths of unrighteousness. To these, the day of the Lord is darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. It shall come to pass at that time, saith the Lord, that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. So we can see that we're definitely in need of this warning presently. It's describing the condition of this world at this time. Um, talks about the pro prophet Jeremiah as Zephaniah, about these coming wo warnings of the sound of the trumpet, the day of trumpet and alarm. And uh, she says, to prepare a people to stand in the day of God, a great work of reform was to be accomplished. God saw that many of his professed people were not building for eternity. And in his mercy, he was about to send a message of warning to arouse them from their stupor and lead them to make ready for the coming of the Lord. Do we have a period of reform going on presently? Yes. Yeah, we're a reform line, right? And that happened in Millerite history, and we're a part of that repeat of history. This warning is brought to view in Revelation 14. So we all know um, the message is here in Revelation 14. This message is declared to be part of the everlasting gospel. The work of preaching the gospel has not been committed to angels, but it has been entrusted to men. Holy angels have been employed in directing this work. They have in, they have in charge the great movements for the salvation of man, but the actual proclamation of the gospel is performed by the servants of Christ upon the earth. So all of this is about a message of reform that has to occur. We're entrusted with the oracles of God, just as the, the Jews were. So then we're going to get to um, the next one. So there's a bunch of interesting things. It's a very good thing chapter to read. Um, and we, where do we get to the falling of the stars? I don't think I. Um, yeah, so it's going to be a bit later. So we got those two, the heralds of the morning. And so it's, he's going to go through Miller first. And the falling of the stars are going to happen in 1833. Um, so here it is. So there's lots there that we're skipping out. But it said, she says, in 1833, two years after Miller began to present in public the evidences of Christ's soon coming, the last of the signs appeared which were promised by the Savior as tokens of his second advent. advent. Said Jesus, the star shall fall, fall from heaven. Matthew 24, 29. And John in the Revelation declared, as he beheld in vision the scenes that should herald the day of God, 
the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This prophecy received a striking fulfillment. And I've been using the wrong microphone here. Now everybody's going to hear me better. I just noticed my other microphone was off. Uh, this prophecy received a striking and impressive fulfillment in the great meteoric, meteoric shower of November 13, 1833. That was the most extensive and wonderful display of falling stars which has ever been recorded. The whole firmament over all the United States being then for hours in fiery commotion. No celestial phenomenon has ever occurred in this country since its first settlement which was viewed with such intense admiration by one class in the community or with so much dread and alarm by another. Its sublimity and awful beauty still linger in many minds. Never did rain fall much thicker than the meteors fell toward the earth. East, west, north, and south, it was the same. In a word, the whole heavens <coughs> seemed in motion. The display, as described in Professor Stillman's journal, was seen all over North America. From two o'clock until broad daylight, the sky being perfectly serene and cloudless, an incessant play of dazzling, brilliant luminosities was kept up in the whole heavens. So, so we're familiar with this. I don't need to go on in, in detail reading all about it. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to look a little bit at what Odilio um, there okay so these are the tokens harbingers signs um so we have their november how come it, it's not showing this properly i think it or is it showing it properly there we go okay i was just looking at the wrong looking at it wrong so here we have um, these three events, November 1st, 1755, May 19th, 1780, November 13th, 1833. And if you watch Odilio's study, he'll go through this and address this chronology. But what he does is he connects these to July 18th. And he looks at the number of days. So uh, from November 1st, 1755 to July 18, 2020, is 96,684 days. It's 264 years, eight, eight months, and 17 days. We have that iteration there of, we could say it's the 17th day of the eighth month. We would have that 178, a symbol of the second half of the year relating to the 2520. So July 18th is a symbol. and so is 178. And also 264, July 18th, 2020, is the 26th day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar, a symbol of July 18th. And then we can see from the dark day is a period of 87,718 days. And there you can see the 718. Now he, he tried to address the 87, and I'm not gonna go into that right now. I think there's more than what he saw. But we can see the symbol of July 18th is in that span of days. And then from the falling of the stars, we have a period of 186 years and 264 days to July 18, 2020. So that's 68,184 days. Now, in, in going through the study, he, he comes upon this idea uh, using the number 28. So I'm not going to go through the whole process of how he does that. It has to do with adding up these different spans of time, specifically November 1st to November 13th. And, and just simply, I guess, the way to look at it is we have 28 and 502 days. That's um, 17, 78 years and 12 days from November 1st to November 13th. 1755 to 1833. And we can see that those are all the numbers of July 18, 2020. It's actually 2187. That could be the 2020, the 18th day, the seventh month. 
but it's this 28 and what he does is he goes to so this uh, i'm going to go a little bit over time here and i apologize but i'm trying to get through this and i'll probably address this in some of the morning studies in more detail but this does come from the morning studies some of this that we're going to look at so he looks at um not numbers 2 28 numbers 2 verse 8 and it says here and his host and those that were numbered thereof were 57,400. So to him, it brings this to the tribe of Zebulun. So the tribe of Zebulun and Eliab, the son of Helen, should be the captain of Zebulun and his host. So they number them and they have 57,400. So what he does is he counts back from July 18th, 2020, 54,000. Um, for 57,400 days, right? So I'm gonna zoom in a bit. So we have these three signs pointing to July 18th, but we have this span of time going back from July 18th to May 23rd, 1863. Now, what is May 23rd, 1863? That's the beginning of the Adventist church established. Yeah, so technically speaking, they they officially are organized May 21st, 1863. But that's the Sabbath. That's the end of the general conference session, May 23rd, 1863. And so it happens to be 57,400 days. But this shows us that we can take the numbering of the children of Israel and see them as spans of time. So this is definitely a span of time. Now, in our study of Judges, uh, we're in Judges chapter 4, well, we're starting in chapter 5, but we came to understand that that's talking about the history of Parminder and Tess, the message that is that's the enemy that God has allowed to test us. And they're going to take 10,000 men from the tribe of Zebulun and Naphtali. That is, Barak is going to take 10,000 men. He's going to have this battle with um, uh, Sisera, who's the general of uh, Eglon, right? Uh, the, uh, Eglon's general, who's the king of Moab, right? Is it the Moabites? If I'm wrong, just correct me if I say something incorrect. No, he's king of Canaan, not the Moabites. King of Canaan. Okay, so you guys should correct me more quickly. So he's the king of Canaan, and he's also uh, the king of, well, he lives in the city of Hazor, um, Cicero does. So... So anyway, we have this um, this connection of Naphtali and Zebulun. And what I did is I looked at this November 13th, 1833 date, and I counted uh, the number of the children of Naphtali, which is 53,400 days. And it brings me to 1980. Now, what we're doing here is we're looking at a mirror. Now, this brings me to the year 1980. But it doesn't bring me to the date that I want. That the date that I see as a parallel to the falling of the stars, November 13th, 1833, is August 11th, 1980. Now I did send um, a document there. I think I sent it. I might not have. Because I've been sending stuff to all kinds of people. Uh, I don't think I actually attached it. I just got to check. Did I attach it? No, I did not. Um, sorry about that. But anyway, there's a document dealing with the falling of the stars. And I don't think it would be quite as a spectacular event, um, but it is an event I witnessed. That is, this is the largest, the most spectacular Perseid meteor shower 
that has ever occurred in recorded history. It was August 11th, 1980. It's the day of my conversion. And I watched this all night. And there was not a moment there was that there was no star in the sky. There, there, there was always a falling star in the sky. So I couldn't read a newspaper by it. But it was completely dark. And at times it was quite bright. But these falling stars did provide light. Um, there was not a cloud in the sky all night. And I was actually in the ideal place to observe this. Now, many people would not. Also, I have um, um, a 2010 vision. Um, so maybe 28 vision. At least I did when I was a teenager. I don't anymore. But I could see uh, stars that other people couldn't see. So I constantly was just amazed at what I saw. But the significance of this chron chronologically wise is it's 14,587 days before July 18th. And what is 14,587? Just on the surface, what is that number? Okay, so Iran puts it connected to the falling of the manna. That is, the manna began to fall on the 16th day of the second month in 1533. And the last day it fell was the 14th day of the first month in 1493. And that's a period of 14,587 days, counting the first day and the last day. But it's also a hundred and it's one tenth of 144,000 plus 187. So it has the symbols of 187 and also a symbol of the 144,000 mixed together. So August 11th, 18, 1980 lines up with November 13th, 1833 as a mirror. And then 252 common months plus one common month later is September 11th, 2001. And we, we said that we could mark September 11th, 2001 as a parallel to the dark day because Ellen White says that the dark day is giving them the, the sign, which is um, the buds of spring. Now, what's the word? What's the phrase she uses? The something buds of spring. The budding trees. Of is the budding trees of spring? Is that what it is? Okay. So the budding trees of spring. And and then we're going to have um, 1100 and uh, 114 common months to March 11th, 2011. Now, what's March 11th, 2011? Wasn't well, that the earthquake in, in, in Fukushima? It, yeah, so it's it's the Japanese earthquake. Now, it also has a significance because it's 311 days before June 22nd, 2011. And June 22nd, 2011 is the day that Jeff received $165,000 to start the School of Profits. So... We can see that this symbol of 311, um, which comes from Samuel Snow's letters, his Pentecost letter that's published on the 11th day of the third month, um, is connected here as well to this March 11th, 2011. So uh, Aran says if you take just the month in the year, it is uh, 31102 versus um in the bible so so you're taking the the year as 2011 in reverse with the the month the three is that what you're doing but you could also overlap those two 11s if you wanted to right so you could have the 311 going one way and the 211 going the other way and the 
the ones just lining up if you wanted. Yeah, so it's it's a symbol then of God's word verses in the Bible. So thanks for that. So here we can see that there's this connection between these tokens that we have received in this movement. Now, some of these tokens, of course, people would say, well, August 11th, 1980, I don't see it as a token. It's something that, you know, Theodore personally has experienced. So why should I listen to it? Somebody has basically said that in commenting on one of my videos about, you know, my birth dates and stuff. But we can see that there is a message that's being given to this movement. And when we study Judges chapter four, it's the message of the chronology. And that, that message primarily has come from me. God's brought it. He's used me as the instrument to bring that message of chronology. But it's going to be the thing that's going to conquer Sisera. And then we have, of course, something that all of us have experienced, September 11th, 2001. And then March 11th, 2011 is something that we see a significance of in connection with um, July 18th because of the connection to Japan, which we have connected the bombing of Hiroshima to July 18th as well. So, so we have all of these different uh, symbols that are tokens in this movement about July 18th. So there's, there's definitely a lot more to it than this. I'm just trying to give you the overview. Now, as far as 2030 is concerned, um, oh, and I just want to, well, I'm not going to address that. I don't have enough time. I've gone over time a bit already. Um, <clears throat> I have some charts, and so we're going to be going through some of these in later studies. Um, and so this is going to address 2030, these 232 years from 1798 to 2030. And we're going to examine these in connection with these numbers that come from uh, the spans of the different tribes. And I'm just going to show you this one just to give you a bit of a taste of it. So September 11th, 1840, what event is that? September 11th, 1840? 14, I meant to say. Yeah. <laughs> September 11th, 1840. Battle of Prosper. Yeah, yeah, or the Battle of Lake Champlain, depending whether you're, which perspective you're looking at it. So this is that date that Miller uh, is instrumental in his conversion. September 11th, 1816, he's going to be converted. Um but he has this event on September 11th, 1814, um, where he sees God's hand. So in, in a sense, it's kind of his conversion, but just not consciously. Now that's gonna be 60,600 days prior to August 11th, 1980. And you can see I have that August 11th, 1980 and July 18th connected. But also you can see it's exactly 187 years to the day to September 11th, 2001 if you can see that there. September 11th, 1814 to September 11th, 2001 is 187 days, or years, I mean. So it's 187 years to the day. Now that can be divided into this 60,600 and 7,700 7, days. So from August 11th, 1980 to September 11th, 2001, so that is from the falling of stars to the dark day in our typical line there is 7,700 days. And then a further 6,886 days to July 18th. And, and there's a lot to this here as well, which I'm, I'm not going to go into uh, in detail. The one thing I do want to point out, though, is that September 11th and September 1814 and 1816 can if we use Judah, the numbers for Judah, it's going to give us two different dates in February. 
February 16th is a symbol. Uh, Samuel Snow's first letter, it's also 216, which is 6 times 6 times 6. And his first letter is published on February 22nd. Now, this, is, of course, is not in the same year. This is three years apart because there's 1,100 days in between these two. But this is the, the counting of the Judah in Numbers chapter 1. And this is the numbers of counting of Judah in, in Numbers 26. So we can see that there is this two countings of the, the tribe of Judah, and both of them connect to these September, September 11th and to these symbols that come from Samuel Snow's letters. And at the bottom here, I just wanted to notice Dan, note Dan. Now, we're going to count from October 22, 1844, and we're going to come to this February 16th, 2021 date. So this is um, part of this span of time of uh, 64,400 days. Now, I didn't put who that was um, here, but it's, it's also Dan, right? So Dan has um, these two different spans. So this is the 64,400, and, and that's going to be Dan um in in numbers 26 so the difference in days between dan in uh numbers chapter 2 and numbers chapter 26 is 1700 days so you can see that 1700 days is the difference and this number here uh 627 days what is 627 a symbol of Okay, Pentecost. How is it a symbol of Pentecost? There's a little bit a roundabout way that it is. Well, June 22nd, 1844, Samuel Snow's Pentecost letter. It's written on June 22nd, which is 622, and we tie that to all the June 22nds and the 622s. Uh, but it's published on June 27th. So that's 627. Now, when we deal with Dan, what is Dan a symbol of? By his name or by his actions? Well, by both. By the name, it's he's judge. Yeah. But by his actions, he's rebellion. And he's also an accuser of the brethren, right? He's a backbiter. Right. Right. Now, so the question is, why do we have Dan here in connection with this history? Um, now, we have June 22nd, 2016. In June 22nd, 2016, I'm at the School of the Prophets. And at that time, I'm a for lack of a better word, a victim of gossip. And I have been ever since I've been in this movement, but particularly in 2016. And then we have February 16th, 2021. Okay, so she has 276, what is Angela saying here? Yeah, so 276 it, that is another iteration of the numbers of the people on the ship in Acts 27. So it's just a, a scrambling of those numbers. But it has to do with a part of this message that has been the subject of uh, character assassination. And we see that a lot in this movement, but very much in particular to the message of chronology that instead of addressing the chronology itself people address rumors and gossip about the messenger and why do people do that what's what's the reason that people don't address what's being taught but they they use gossip and slander
Because they're scared. Scared? Okay. Um, they're, guess... they're scared. They, they don't have the desire to put forth the effort to understand what's being said. Yeah. Often what people say is that they're intimidated. And I guess that's a type of fear. Uh, they're intimidated by me, which which I find very humorous on one level because I'm not an intimidating person. Um, very patient, gentle, and kind. It's just not a part of my nature more than anything. But I'm going to treat everybody fine. I'm not going to, you know, treat somebody mean. But I think part of it is that people don't, as you're saying, people don't want to study. That is, they can't fight the battle um, on on the ground of scripture. They don't have a thus saith the Lord. They can't look at each at the issues. It's too complicated, they say. And so they use character assassination. And and so that's why I think Dan is being used here. But we can see all these symbols, Samuel Snow's letters, are being used here. And, and in a sense, in a reverse order, February 16th would be the publication of his first letter. And then you're going to have June 22nd, 1844, as the publication or the writing of his third letter. And it's published on June 27th, which is that span of time in between going to October 22nd, 1844, which is ultimately what he's predicting. So I think it's pretty interesting what we have found. And this is just touching the surface of what we found. We know Judah, Judah is the line of the tribe of Judah. He's opening up to William Miller light, correct? So he's connected to September 11th, 1814 and 1816. But again, he brings us to these symbols in our history of Samuel Snow's letters. So it's tying Miller and Snow together. So, as we proceed in this study of 2030, we're still going to be addressing quite a bit of chronology, though I'm probably going to try to limit the chronology to the Friday nights and, and try to keep the Sabbaths where I get into the meat of, of the issues here dealing with the World Economic Forum and their plans. So any final questions before we close with prayer? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath that's coming, and we ask that you can work upon our hearts. We are so convicted by the light that you've given us, and yet at times we do not want to behold it. We would rather hide in the darkness. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts, to be awakened by these heralds of the morning, by, this, by these tokens. And that we can point others to them and that they can be um, aroused from their slumber. Be with each of us, each person studying, each of us in our study, that we can be corrected. Give us strength in the trials that we face. And be with us tomorrow in the meetings. Help us to um, represent you to others. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.